And in today's episode, we've got Joey Johnson. Number 17? Number 17. Yeah, and last week, we spoke a little bit to Joey, but primarily we um, talked to his son, Spencer. Yeah, this is part two in the Johnson family doubleheader. And we'll make it a triple eventually where we'll talk to Uncle Jimmy. To Jim, Uncle Jimmy. Who runs Advantage Tennis Academy, Southern California. Yeah. With... Uh, yeah, we'll get into uh, Joey's journey, and obviously they'll bring up when when I met him, and um, he makes his living as a mental coach. Title of his book's Worthy to Win. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's get the show road and rolling. Let's give him a call. Yeah, so last week, I mean, just to, yeah. if you missed last week's episode, Joey's son, Spencer, junior tennis player, blue chip, just signed uh, recently with UCLA. So we had yeah, and, and, and certainly, uh, you know, he's been part of uh, our curriculum, yeah. our program for a long time. Yeah, and I do think that he did an excellent job, Spencer, as far as um, inf- teaching his information transfer. Yeah. So he 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 definitely uh, you know, the training to become an independent thinker, problem solver. Yeah, and at seventeen, you think a lot of times, you know, the Mark Twain. When I was 17, <laughs> um, or when I turned 21, I, how does it go? Help me out. 17, 21. When I was 17, my father didn't know very much, but by the time I turned, <laughs> turned 21, I couldn't believe how much my father had learned. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. That's a great quote. But yeah. at 17, I just picked the number <laughs> seven, you know, and yet seven years, which is a long time. And he's only 24 years old. Yeah. So pro tennis beyond UCLA, Dare to dream. Uh, college tennis is a goal. Pro tennis is a dream. Yeah. All right. We'll get this man on the line here. Hello. Joey Johnson, welcome to the Great Base Tennis Podcast, where dreams come true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good. Um, <laughs> You're going. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I knew this was going to be a big, just, a big. Yeah. I knew this was going to be a big night. This is going to be a breakthrough for me. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Life changing experience. There you go. Welcome to the Great Base exactly. Podcast, the home of life changing experiences. That was well, great. To, great I, to have you on. I, Thanks I, for the time. Thank you. It's a privilege to always talk with. Uh, Steve Smith and Andy Fitzell. So thank you for thinking of me and asking me. <clears throat> Let's follow up on uh, last week's segment for a few minutes. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the young one? Child number five for you and Wendy. <laughs> well, um, no, I thought I thought that was it was a really interesting interview and I thought he was able to articulate a lot of things. Um that he's trying to figure out, you know, in his own mind and in his game. And, um, I, 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 I think that, um, he's well, one, one thing that I think is that there's so many different, you know, skills that need to be developed for a tennis player. And after I said, you know, there's all kinds of things that were talked about that you just need to keep pounding, pounding at and getting better at. And, yeah. um, you know, um, it's a long, and, um, but I think he, I think he understands that and, you know, and he certainly has a lot of learning and growing still to do, but, um, you know, thanks to a a good foundation and, and, um, a lot of things that were discussed in the training and in that podcast about training and all that, um, he's in a good place. You know, I, I always like to say, I think I said this last week, you know, that, um, if you can, two, key things you know if you can keep a kid uh, injury free and um, enjoying the game somehow they're still having fun with it then i think the rest is a lot easier yeah now, i was going to ask you about your relationship i mean as far as parents out there listening also coaches but you know the question comes up a lot lots of different questions but you know for example you know the father son relationship as far as father coach um, also just mm-hmm. people ask quite often, you know, when do you start a kid and how much do they play and all those kind of things. Maybe you could touch, touch upon those. Yeah. The father son relationship. I mean, I think, um, since I have four other kids and my old, 
closest child, um, or our, our oldest child, I should say. My wife and I is, is Ethan, and and all my kids, I growing up, but um, they all were, you know, kind of local kind of players, and we had a lot of fun. I mean, I coached all of them in high school, which was really a neat opportunity. So yeah. um, I had a little practice, you know, in the sense that I coached every one of them, you know, through some local tournaments and things, but we weren't doing what Spencer's done, you know, to that extent, but they all were multi-sport athletes. They all had, they all were very up. So I had some, some practice and it was just, it was fun. You know, tennis was a fun thing. We did kind of a cultural thing in our family and yeah. um, certainly kind of culminated with the high school experience where I was helping coach them. And that was really, I mean, I have some great memories with each of them. My, my older son, my three daughters and, and, and Spencer too, you know, so, um, so by the time he came along, I mean, I, I really didn't think any of my kids would, you know, pursue tournament tennis. I, I don't know. I just, I wasn't, I wasn't even really thinking about it. Like, okay, I wasn't planning that, you know, mm-hmm. it was, and all of a sudden, cause Spencer played, um, he played, uh, you know, like uh, little league, uh, football actually was really getting into it. And I think one of the things that, um, I mean, he played his first sectional term when he was almost 12 years old. So mm-hmm. I think one of the first things that excited him about tennis was that, you know, you're not, you get to compete more, you know, you're in the action more. And he, and he liked that. You know, I remember when he played, he won like a green dot tournament with some little local tournament. And he was like, man, that was awesome. <laughs> I think part of it was just, that he, he got to play the whole yeah. time, you know? And, and so, and, and he liked that competing part of it. So, um, but as far as our relationship, you know, it was, I mean, for me, it was kind of uncharted water. I mean, I certainly had coached a ton of other kids, not my own mm. tur- at a tournament level, though. My kids was, it was more recreational. It was just more fun. And, yeah. you know, um, I, I traveled with many players over the years, you know, some tour players and, and uh, a lot of juniors and, you know, and just, so it was almost unexpected. It was a little surprising when it started happening. And um, there was a day he, he looked at me, he was probably 12. We were talking about something, you know, with his game. And he said, Hey, he looked me square in the eye and said, Hey, will you make me your number one priority? And I remember thinking, <laughs> that's a really interesting question for one of my kids to ask me, you know, and he meant like as a tennis player. Yeah. And w- when he asked me that question, I knew I was in for it. <laughs> I was like, Oh man, this is, Here we go. this is going to be a, a long ride. But uh, you know, anyway, so it just kind of unraveled, you know, one step at a time. I think it, it there was no grand plan, you know, um, yeah. for any of, of these guys, but other than to really have fun with it and, and see where we go. You know, and you said uh, in the action, you know, a tennis match can last three hours. Uh, the up and coming player, Yannick Center, who is um, such a great young snow skier, mm. and all someone has to do is look on YouTube. And he said what he liked about tennis is, wasn't over so fast. You yeah, yeah. get on the slope and boom, you're racing and it's over pretty quickly. But one thing is father son conflicts, uh, like mother daughter conflicts. It's interesting to study the history of tennis. There's exceptions to the rule, but most great tennis players, it's the daughter with the father mm-hmm. and it's the son with the mother. Um, actually, mm-hmm. before the podcast, uh, Mike Rogers, who trained to teach tennis 100 years ago, uh, I got a text from him and he said, Macker and O'Connor's on the tennis channel. Yeah. And um, there's two great American champions, but with, uh, it was Gloria Connors with, um, with Jimmy and it was John senior with John. Um, so mm-hmm. there's, again, there's two players where it's the opposite, but, but if you just went right down, uh, Courier and his mother, Everett and her father, just American players, yeah. Capriati and her father, but you didn't really um, push Spencer too much. You, it sounds like he just kind of found the passion on his own, which is great. Um, but what do you feel like your relationship has been with him once he started to go, okay, I want to get serious about this. Did you find that you could push him more and, and take a more active role that way? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, you know, but I, th- I think what it started with was kind of him asking, mm-hmm. you know, hey, I want, I want, rather than me going, hey, this is what we're doing. Just get your yeah. stuff, we're going. You know, that was never really like that. It was more, maybe it was a little bit where I'd say, hey, let's go hit a few. Let's go hit a few. And, 
but it was more of him, you know, once he kind of said that to me and it was like, I'm like, you really want to do this because it's going to be hard. And, you know, I kind of prepare him for Mm. how much work this was going to be. And, you know, um, you know, knowing just because I went through it, you know, um, I mean, differently than, than what he's done, but I, I think that we really worked well together in large, you know, because, you know, it, the idea kind of originated from him and, and then I was like, all right, I want to do everything I can to help. And, you know, there were some things I did differently with him that I didn't do with my other kids, including really kind of using the, the off great base, you know, um, that was different. And, um, but our relationship as we've worked over the years and, you know, we've done, we had a lot of one, one time on the court and, you know, and, and, and even in mental talks and things like that, but tournaments, I mean, you know, I've been to a million tournaments with them and, and, um, we've, we've done all right. You know, I, mm-hmm. you know, we, and Spencer's a pretty, um, I mean, he, he tries to be an obedient kid, you know, and he's, he's, he's done a pretty good job. It's not easy, you know, having a, a dad or a mom on the court with you, you know, X amount of hours out of the day, tournaments, post-match, you know, gr- grilling kids after losses. I mean, going through the, all the details of, you know, um, post-match reflection, all that, and, and, you know, and the travel and just the, you know, the grind of it all. Um, I mean, it's, it's not easy, you know, it's, Steve knows that from, from his own experiences as being a, a as coach slash dad. But, um, I think it's been really good overall. And my wife has had a big part of that too, you know, behind the scenes. And, and she's, she's a, she wants all my to excel. She's always been about pushing them to explore their talents and get and take the most or make the most out of, their talent. She's done an amazing job with that. And so it's been a, it's definitely a team effort, you know, but my time with him and he's received a lot of support from my other kids too. I mean, the tremendous amount, but the, um, my time with him has been, it's been really, it's been really amazing. You know, I mean, it's been fun. And, um, there's times that I'm like, man, this is, this is a long haul, you know, but mm-hmm. it's, it's been, it's been really cool. You know, in general, I'm, I'm really grateful for, the opportunity to be doing it and and i and i and i work with other players too and i love it you know i mean i yeah. that's this is just kind of what i've been doing for a long time if you were to give just some general advice for parents listening what you know as far as helping their junior go down down the road to college tennis or to um, reach their goals what what would be some maybe a couple points that you would tell parents some advices well in, in the, you know, in the mindset training I do, you know, and I call what I do mindset development, which it, I started working with, I, you know, it started kind of coming to me when I, when I worked with a tour player many years ago. Um, I, I think that that's kind of the foundation, you know, so your kids, I really believe this and this isn't just a, you know, a thing because this is what I do, but I really believe that getting them to have this kind of healthy mindset, you know, my, I, you know, my thing is called worthy to win. And I talk a lot about inner worthiness and mm-hmm. I like to say that, um, in fact, I, I, I've done some work over the past year and a half with Mikhail Torpegard, mm-hmm. who you actually referred yeah. me to yeah. and, um, uh, and, and JJ, those guys, um, the, um, so we did a lot of work together right before COVID. He was, you know, we spent a lot of time together, he, him and I, Torpegard and I, and, and um, and he had kind of a nice little run. He he won the Cleveland Challenger. Then he a couple yeah. weeks later he lost in the, in the finals at Columbus to JJ. And then he went over to Russia and he was in the quarters when they ordered everybody basically you better leave now if you're going to get back into the country for COVID. So yeah. he was rolling and and um, he said to me after um, Cleveland after he had that win he said that was the healthy he said it was the healthiest tennis I've ever played in my life and I thought that was really interesting word choice you know yeah. he was. I, you know, the most fun, I, I wasn't bogged down with all my, some of the distractions I deal with. And I just was able to kind of just play and focus on, on playing my game. And, and I, I like that word. And, um, and I, so for parents, let me loop back to your question is, you know, first and foremost, it's like have the foundation laid that, um, this is why they're doing it, you know, that, I have something in the, in the beginning of the introduction of my book, Worthy to Win, where I say that one big challenge that a lot of 
athletes have is that there's a sometimes this belief or perception that personal gain or advancement can somehow bring feelings of validity of, or worth to them. Mm. And I, I really think that's, that's a big mental obstacle that can really be a hindrance to a lot of athletes. Um, and because then they're always looking for something, they want something from it, you know, and they think it's going to bring something nebulous, hard to describe to them. that's going to make them, you know, I guess happy in a sense, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I was going to say quickly from your book, I remember that, you know, it's also created so much self pressure. You were talking about that. Exactly. So, I mean, yeah, what, what I write in there is I say this belief creates a desperation for success that mm-hmm. can wear down even the most skilled and talented performers. And that, that desperation, if it continues, creates a pressure that will it'll leave scarred and there's a lot of self-doubt, you know. So parents, you know, it's like um, it's, it's easy to get sucked into um, my kids, you know. Um, are they progressing? How are they doing compared to the other kids? You know, in rankings, you know, you know, UTR now, all these things. And sometimes parents get so into it, you know, oh my gosh, you lost that guy. He was a, you know, a blankety blank UTR. I can't believe it, you know. And it's, this is rolling off the tongue of parents more and more, you know. And yeah. and I think that is, that is to me, is like, uh, so <laughs> not, not how to do it, you know. It's like, make it up. And you talk about this all the time. If you can make improving fun and exciting, like, man. You know, I mean, of course, I'm, I'm not trying to downgrade winning, you know, when I say this. I mean, because ultimately, the goal is to win. I mean, yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that. Let's make, let's make no excuse. I mean, uh, you know, that, that's that's fine. But feeling like you're getting better and like you're really working on things and improving, if you can find joy in that, man, I, I think that's golden. You know, that is a kid who is going to want – I I used to do this as a sensor. I'd be like – and all my kids, I'd always want to end the workout with them going – I oh just give me a few more of those. <laughs> no, we got to go. Sorry, we got to go. You know, dinner time or whatever, and and leave the court making them feel like that. You know, and I tried to do that when they were younger. Yeah, wanting more. I remember from Wayne Bryan's book, he said the same thing with his sons. You know, the Bryans. Yeah, yeah we touched upon yeah. that earlier. Yeah. Gl- yeah. Uh, Gloria Connors did that with Jimmy as well. Yeah, if they're all pumped up and say, "Hey, it's time time to go." Yeah. So the word that you liked there it was healthy. I think is what I took out of that is, you know, try to have a healthy relationship between all the skill building and tournament play and on court and off court, have that balance. I do. I do think the parents, um, you know, you hear tennis teachers say, or people will say about tennis teachers, oh, they're on the same page, but they say, well, we don't even think they're from the same book. But when it comes down to parents, I tell parents, number one mistake is the parents disagree with each other in front of the child. You know, it's obviously healthy to disagree. Uh, everyone's not the same. Uh, but, you know, the, we'll talk more about that. We've, we're finally set to go next week with uh, brain typing. And yeah. a lot of times the parents, opposites attract. And the kids know that and they become the master manipulator. They work one child off the next. But, mm-hmm. um, no, you and your wife, Wendy, have done a great job with Spencer as a kid. You know, people come to us and, you know, I tell, you know, children all the time, we've got to group of a dozen players here right now. They're all good kids to say at a higher level, they're all great kids, but you know, we're trying to make them great players. So uh, there's, um, yeah, I think back in the nineties, um, it didn't, it didn't work. We're, we're self-esteem. Um, you know, we just, we're all wrapped up in self-esteem where, um, when it comes down to it, you couldn't use a red pen to mark a kid's paper and, right, right. and everybody gets a participation trophy and you're going to play soccer games. <laughs> it was kind of, you know, funny stories where, you know, seven year olds play a game of soccer. They're not keeping score, but the seven year olds, they're just repeating the score as they walk off the field. <laughs> but yeah, I do think it's, um, <laughs> you know, the, the winning, I like to tell people when it comes to parenting, uh, in the end, it does come down to self inf- self-inflicted pressure, you know, parent pressure, peer pressure. Um, but it, when it comes down to healthy, it should be looked upon as this is fun. This is what I trained for. I, I like the, the idea if you get people to love practice. Mm. I, I love to go to practice. Um, 
that's, that's, what, that's what I'm saying, Steve. You know, I, I'm saying that if you can get them into that frame of mind, then it's then it's it, it's so it changes everything to me. You know, it's like then they're going to do the training that a lot of kids don't want to do. They're going to do the hard yards of of the fundamental training, whether it's technique or tactics. You know, all the things that need to have fitness. They're gonna they're gonna have longevity too because. Uh, one of my favorite, I, I remember watching an interview that Martina Navratilova gave a while ago that she had done post, you know, at the end of her career. I always perceived her as being just a cutthroat competitor. She was tough. She was just, you know, intense. And I remember, in that, and I don't want to quote her verbatim, but I remember her saying, for me, it was more about not just being number one, but it was more about me improving. It was just my thing, just getting better at things. And I, when I heard her say that. I was like, wow, I wouldn't have thought that from her because she – my perception of her was she was such a crazy competitor, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I really do think that all the top players have some of that, you know, they're, they, they just, they're so into getting better, you know, <laughs> and, and they compete, obviously the competitors and like Steve talked about working with pressure. Um, yeah, I, in my training, I, I'm, uh, that's a huge part of what I do is I try to get people to want, want the pressure essentially, you know, it's like M- Michael Jordan, give me the ball, yeah. you know, you, you know, where they want it. Because they just really aren't that worried about the consequences of losing, you know, and that's that's a big thing Jordan talks about in a couple of his books. I, I love Michael Jordan and you know the things that he um, talked about. He talks a lot about how he overcame his own fear and stuff, and he and he talks about that like you know the consequences. He's the guy who took the shot at the end, right? So if they lose the game, you know, they you know he's the last guy who took the shot, and he said, I I never thought about those consequences. I trained myself to not think about it. I just accepted it. Okay, I'm the guy. You know, this is what I'm going to do. We always we always talk about Vic Braid. And, you know, grew, grew up in Monroe, Michigan. Played three sports, and he was a high school quarterback, five foot six. His favorite sport was um, was tennis. Excuse me, was uh, basketball. Um, with um, with basketball, he used to always say, well, "Let me say this about tennis." He won the high school state championship three times in Michigan, but with basketball. I want the kid who wants to take the shot with, you know, one second left on the clock. Mm-hmm. As, you, as you said, no consequences. You know, we've, we're putting up some basketball hoops uh, out here at Happy Lane where we work and a little, little facility we've set up. And But we have soccer. And granted, tennis is much more technical. Not to downplay if someone to be a great soccer player. We had kids reading off... Uh, yeah, ham quotes the other day, mm. but it's amazing how much faster kids improve at soccer than at tennis. Now I know we have to keep hounding them on, you know, the grips and the shape of the swing and such. But when the kids go to play pickup soccer, winning is not everything. Mm. They're just actually playing. You know, it's yeah, having having fun. Um, you know, we always say, okay, today we had a dozen kids playing soccer. And if we had the same dozen kids, we put out six matches. Um, they all go to lunch. If it was soccer, they don't even talk about who they played with as the score was. But by the time they come back from lunch, if they played sets, they, they've talked to everybody. What was the score? What was the score? Yeah, what was yeah, the score? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> um, with uh, Let's talk a little bit about uh, your journey in tennis. And, and then in doing that, uh, we could circle back and you could contrast and uh, say what was different about your you know, your beginnings in tennis versus say your sons Spencer's. Um, so I grew up in northern Minnesota. Um, tennis hotbed in Duluth, Del- Del- <laughs> Duluth, <laughs> which is way up there. A lot, and, a lot uh, of palm I trees. Say that, <laughs> a lot of palm trees. <laughs> I always say I, I think I learned my grit. Um, whatever grit I had, I learned it as an a early morning paper boy for about three, three years. <laughs> yeah, um, but below zero, I grew up in a, yeah, way below zero. Um, I grew up in a skiing family and me and two brothers, um, Jimmy and Mitch, we, we all were competitive skiers and we learned to ski on ice and we, mm-hmm. we raced, you know, slalom, giant slalom. And, you know, and then we actually, when we were kids, the U S ski jump and the U.S. cross country team were based in Duluth. They did a lot of their training there. So we, I, I mean, as a little kids, we did the uh, the little kids training for ski jumping. We you know, we go to a little camp, and then we got into the the fall um, skiing. And 
Alpine, you know, and then, um, you know, one of my favorite memories of my brother Jimmy is he snuck up on some of the scaffold jumps that the Olympic team would train at night. They'd have the lights on, but there'd be nobody there. And we'd sneak up with our flown skis and we'd go off these big jumps and kind of, kind of crazy. You know, we, we took, we took Jimmy up to the top of one and he was probably like 11. I mean, it was, you know, a huge jump for a kid like that. And, and we, once you walk up, you can't go down. And he was, he got up there and he looked down and he started freaking out, you know? And, and I was like, <laughs> I was a little scared for him. I'm like, you have to go off this thing or you can't walk back down. It's too icy. And he went off that thing and the look, you know, to see him get, get all pumped up at the landing was <laughs> such a fun memory, but that's, that's what we did. So, um, we skied. And then, um, when I was about 10 years old, my parents split up and, um, Skiing is a pretty expensive sport, you know, it just became more difficult for us to compete. And my, my older brother, Mitch came home one day. It was when I was about 10 and he, he said, Hey, I, I learned how to play tennis today. And he was talking about some tennis coaches at the park and helping kids. And, and we were, we all played like little league baseball. And I, I just did not, I was not a big baseball fan. I mean, to, to me, it was boring, you know, and I probably wasn't that good at it, you know, but I, um, I remember, I challenged him. I was like, come on, let's go. Let's go play. You know, I'd never picked up a rack in my life. You know, went out to these courts by our house. And um, I remember, you know, playing with him and just kind of falling. I, I remember he double faulted a bunch of times and I beat him. <laughs> and I, didn't, I, didn't even do, I didn't even do anything. And I was like, this is awesome. Yeah, exactly. I can beat my older brother, you know. All so you Mitch, Mitch, yeah, pretty much. And we were so competitive. I mean, it, we couldn't walk this, go across the street, with the bed and, you know, who could get across first, you know? And so Mitch um, was the one who really got me and Jimmy going. He was, you know, and he, he played at Valparaiso College in Indiana. And he, he was the impetus to getting us all involved in it. And, and it was, I was going to say, because my, my parents were split up in different places. My mom worked full time and there's just a lot of stuff going on. The tennis kind of raised us. I really feel like that. Like tennis was, a, was, a was, a big part of what helped us learn about life. And I'll, I'll be ever for grateful, be forever grateful for that. That's awesome. Um, so, so I started playing, you know, and we were just, you know, we were just hacking up in Northern Minnesota. I mean, I learned how to play on a wall. There was an old wall. It was an old university by our house. And I'd go over there a lot of times because I was, you know, I'd be alone or whatever kids, you know, I mean, we, I'd go over there for hours and hours and I'd just bang on this wall with, you know, an old wood racket and, count how many times I could hit a forehand, you know, 25 and I go home and I write it down on a sheet of paper. Oh, mm -hmm. no, I hit 35 in a row. And I did that for a long time. I literally, I mean, I put a lot on this old wall and it was really kind of interesting because it was, it was at the university and they would dump coal on where the ground was a shoot that you'd open up. So I'd come home, my balls would be like black as coal, you know, <laughs> it was, it was, you know, it was just, and it was a tiny little area. I'd sit on this wall and then, and then we'd start, that was during the tennis boom, you know, it was in the seventies. And so we'd go down to the local park club and stuff and, and people would be lined up waiting, you know, that, that, those are the days when you'd like, Hey, I'll play, you know? And I mean, it was, in, it was crazy even up in Minnesota. I mean, so it became, our summers were just, just, we just stay at the local courts all day long, you know? Did, and did just, you play indoor tennis? All, did you play any in the winter in uh, Duluth? A little bit. A little bit, but again, it's kind of expensive. I mean, there there was like four indoor courts in Duluth. I mean, that was it. And they were, you know, so I didn't play a lot, but I tried. I mean, I, I did get up there as often as I could. Um, but, you know, that that was it. I mean, and by the time I was I was uh, almost 15, uh, I ended up deciding to go live with my dad in Indiana. And hence ended definitely my skiing days. But um, by that time, I, was, I had played junior tournaments and I was into it and I you know when I was 15 uh, when I went out and lived with my dad we uh, I actually played at um, two schools uh, one in it's a place called Merrillville and then I transferred to Carmel and Carmel's where Todd Witzkin played um, mm -hmm. and I remember my dad he, one day he just said look you know I, I think this is gonna, you're going to really have to pursue tennis for call, to get a college scholarship basically saying you're gonna to need to do this you know um just mm -hmm. financially and and i you know there was something that clicked in my brain i mean i was already working hard and i was pretty focused i was very one-track minded i was like that's all i'm doing you know i was very 
mildly obsessed with it. I mean, really. And, um, but without, without, with very little, you know, I'd say formal instruction. And, um, and so I, then I kind of upped it, I upped it, you know, I, I've never met anybody who's hit as many serves as I did. I probably hit serves six to seven days a week for five or six years. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I yeah, served yeah, every I, I can tell a story day. about that when we talk about where you initially, you went with the first college you went to, but actually uh, going back, Todd Witzkin, I remember he beat uh, Jimmy Connors at the, at the U.S. Open. Joan Ramey Ford, um, you yeah. remember that name? She used to hire students that I trained. She had a tennis camp in Indiana. And she, no, I don't. She had a connection with his tennis game. Uh, but Rajiv Ram, um, I was at the Smith Academy just for a short time. Um, I understand they have a facility now, uh, an indoor facility, but not too long ago, um, they had an old warehouse that was a Home Depot. Uh, so anyway, I had two players. Actually, we went to meet Jeremy Wordsman, and who's the coach at the University of Indiana. Mm-hmm. It's really funny. Not to digress too much, but uh, to just compliment this academy. So we're walking across the parking lot, and one kid's steering this big car, and the other kid's pushing it. And a nice lady stops and goes, hey, I have AAA. Can I help you out? And the, the kids, <laughs> maybe it was a young coach steering the car, and one kid behind it pushes and says, no, this is fitness. Thank, yeah. thank you. I'm working out. <laughs> Just pushing the car all the time. So, but that's a, Carmel, that's a pretty upscale place, correct? There's a lot of tennis there? Yeah, yeah. It's a very, I mean, they were, that was a really great high school for sports. I was only there for, you know, less, I mean, a year, but it was, um, it was great. And I, I was way behind the eight ball though. You know, I had barely competed in any national events. I mean, just didn't have the, the, you know, the funding or whatever to travel around the country. And so what happened was I was starting to think about college tennis and, I, and you know, I started talking about D one tennis. I was like 14 and all my friends laughed at me. I mean, they're like, there's no way. What are you talking about? You, mm-hmm. you'd be lucky to play college tennis anywhere. And which was probably a realistic thing at that point. I mean, I, it was a pipe dream, you know, but I got that stuck in my head when I was about 14. I'm going to play D1 tennis. And I was, I was not let go of that dream. And it came for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, we grew up in this, in this really tough environment with, you know, going through some big challenges with our family as kids. And, you know, and I, in looking back, I, you know, I lacked a lot of inner confidence as a, as a kid. And, um, and so I started looking to other things that could bring that, to me in my life subconsciously you know just I did sports was a big part of that I, you know, my sense of identity and purpose started more and more to evolve around you know what you did in sports which that that has a double-edged sword you know mm-hmm. I mean it, it, when I was really young I think it was it kind of kept me going it gave me purpose it gave me something to hope for when when there was a lot of you know difficult times going on in life and a lot of challenges but as I became older and even into college, you know, it, it created this ridiculous pressure that is just nobody can compete with. You know, you can't, you can't play tennis to, to gain happiness. Like, oh, if I could just win this and I'm going to feel good about me, you know, there's right. nobody can tolerate that. Nobody. Um, it, it's going to, you're going to, you're going to hit a wall. And so, and I think a lot of players do that when they realize they, they not do it forever, but they do it at times. So, yeah. Um, I call that the worthiness dilemma in my book. And that's what I was going through. So what happened was, um, as far as the schools, to kind of finish your train of thought here, is I started talking to colleges when I was in Indiana, like there was Butler and Purdue and IU. And, you know, I talked to the University of Minnesota and big schools. You know, nobody, you know, offered me 10 cents. I mean, um, I was lucky if I got them on the phone with me. And so, and it was like, it was this, this really harsh realization nobody wants you, you know, <laughs> and I was devastated for a while. I was like, Oh my gosh, you know? And, you know, meanwhile, I mean, I don't have a national ranking. I'm not playing any national tournaments. I mean, I'm just doing what I can in my hometown, you know, and, mm-hmm. and thinking that it's going to all work. And, um, so what ended up happening was my, there was Steve Wilkinson was at Gustavus Adolphus college in St. Peter, Minnesota. Somehow I got connected to Steve and he, he was an amazing coach. That guy coached flat out. I mean, he knew a lot about the game. Steve was, he had been a really good player in, in college and 
and an amazing coach. He runs these camps, Tennis and Life, which has been there for you know many, many years. Um, and Steve was such a just. Uh, Steve passed away some years ago, but um, I, I kept in touch with him right up before he passed away yeah, he was, periodically. He's a he, great, great amateur player. Um, I remember listening to him speak many times. Um, but yeah, yeah go ahead. He's, he's, in the, he's in the Tennis Hall of Fame, you know. And yeah. Steve, he just he was a he was just a, a humanitarian, I and mean, he he knew oh, this is a kid who needs help, and. He said, "Why don't you come out here and you can work at my camp, and then we'll we'll send you to some tournaments." And so I'd I'd work at his camp, and he'd like help me pay for tournaments that summer. And this is when I was like, you know, seventeen, eighteen. I mean, right before I graduated. And mm-hmm. he said, "Then you can cut, you can try to in the fall." And so, and that was the first year I got I got to go to a national event. I I got to play at the at the intersectional. And Steve was a big part of that. I mean, he gave me some opportunities to play with some college kids, and you know, and I went there. I remember I beat a kid eighty in the country, and I was like. I, I was like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> um, but, you know, meanwhile, so I started there, and here's how the story goes. I I was, I was, a um, couple things. I was, I had a big kick serve, and in those days, the American twist serve, I mean, my toss was way behind me, and I'd, you know, be out there and be really cold, and I, I over a period of about a month, I literally just tore all the muscles in my lower back, <laughs> and I kept playing, I kept playing, and, and I think, um, you know, Steve, I, I don't know if he thought I was faking it or what, but I was like, you know, I can't even, I can't, no way I can play tennis. And it got to a point where I had done it with some doctors and things. And I, and I was out. I mean, I could not play. The other thing that was going on that I, I talked to kids about, this is I was, I was just a partier. I mean, I was out of control in some ways. I was very undisciplined with that. And um, it was a big problem. And I realized that the good part i realized it so i i decided to redshirt because i i could not play and the doctor said this could take four four to six months you know right then right then the timing was perfect my dad took a job in texas he was in sales and um we we moved down there and he said come on down here and we'll, we'll get you healed up and then you can go back to gustavus you know but while i was there you know, I got my dad was he was my dad was always pushing us in sports he he wanted all of us to compete my dad was a great uh, cross country skier, you know, was a really good high school skier in Minnesota, and just pushed himself really hard. And he he wanted all of us to compete, so he was a big part of the kind of the you know me, all my me and my two brothers all played college tennis, and you know, and me and I've been in the tennis for our whole lives. But um, that that was my dad, and so he sat down with me and said, "Look, if you really want to play D1 tennis, why don't, you know you need to build your game. Why don't we look at some junior colleges?" At first. I was like, no, that sounds kind of rinky dink, you know, cheesy, you know. Mm-hmm. But there's one there's sound, you know, we, we talked about it together. There's one in Tyler, and he, he had made a call to the coach, and, you know, and he kind of talked me into it. And I'm like, all right. So we drove up there, and this was like in May. And, um, and so I had redshirted, you know. Um, and I remember we went up, and that's where Steve was. I met Steve there, he's running his, the tennis tech program. Um, he wasn't coaching the team, but I met him while I was there. And and I remember sitting and watching those guys. Most of them were foreign players. And I, was, I remember thinking, I don't even know if I have these teams. These guys are good, you know, like they're really good. And the coach kind of challenged me. He said, look, you can work all summer on your game really hard, you know, get your back in shape and all that. And if you want to come try out for the team in, you know, in uh, August or whenever we did it, tryouts he, he was really he had this we played a big round robin term he goes if you make it i'll give you a scholarship if you don't you won't get anything you know yeah. i went home i thought about it i was inspired by that i was like man that this could be an opportunity you know and, yeah. and i took the challenge you know and I, I worked my tail off that summer including getting my back health and getting healed and started playing so i was in texas now i was playing much better players i mean you know, kind of inspired me to really work hard over those four months. Um, and uh, I met I met my future roommate Sam Olson, who was in Steve's program. And Sam Sam had a brother brother who lived in San Antonio. We hit some balls together, and you know, it was it was just it was like a four month you know kind of recuperation slash you know the tennis development thing. And then I went tried out and played really well. I, I still remember it. You know, made the team, and I was so pumped just to be on that team and. I was there for two years and it was like a two year tennis camp for me. I mean, I worked so hard there and 
and it changed my tennis game. You know, it was it was an amazing experience. You know, Steve, I talked. I, I I was kind of inquisitive when you say Steve. Yeah, no, I, listeners. Uh, Joey's always asking me questions, and I was not the team coach. I was I was started this academic program in eighty one. I lived in Tyler, Texas, eighty one, ninety one. Um, and by that time, when I started, I had the chance to rewrite that curriculum, redesign it. Um, I had already been trained by Vandermeer, Van Horn, and Braden. So when the players on the team would ask me a question, uh, you know, it was a little bit awkward because I had some information that the coach didn't have. Um, and, you know, and that happens. But no, certainly uh, you were just young and naive, and you would come up and ask me about your matches right, right in front of the head coach. Um, what well, year was this? Did they have color TV or? <laughs> I'm teasing, but what year was this? I think you probably were there. I would guess 83 that you went there, right? Is that right? 83? Yeah, it was probably, I think it was 84 because I graduated in 82. I redshirted, you know, okay. 83. I mean, so yeah, yeah, I was right so there. I had, I had been there for three years. I was 29 years old. But our, our listeners, junior college tennis in the heyday, the tennis boom. And we've talked a little bit about that with these podcasts. James Van Allen been in the tiebreaker put tennis in a time capsule, tennis can be put on TV. And then there was the battle of the sexes, Billie Jean King coming to the rescue where Margaret Court had lost to uh, Bobby Riggs on Mother's Day. And it was September of 73. Everybody was playing tennis. When you mentioned people were lining up yeah. to get a one hour court time at a public park, but at junior college tennis, um, at one time there was 32 junior college men's teams in Florida alone. Um, so the, the level of play, um, and, and a lot of the foreign players, this happens a little bit now, but it happened a lot back then. So Tyler junior college is the acronym is TJC. And of course there's USC university of Southern Cal. I used to tell people, some of the players came over, they didn't know, they didn't know the difference between TJC and USC. Yeah. Um, so there's some really good tennis players. I remember working with Renato Figueredo who, um, he lost in the final and the finals at those times they were flighted flight one, two, three, four, mm -hmm. five, all the ones who play a tournament. And if you won in the front draw the championship side of the bracket, your team would get one point. Then you'd play in the back draw and your team would get half a point. So anyway, Figueredo got to the finals and he lost to Pernfors and it wasn't shortly after that. Pernfors won two NJCA titles. Yeah. Then he won two NCA titles yeah, in legend. Georgia. Yeah. 11 in the world. He had the French open final. And interesting, he came over to the United States. He didn't have a scholarship. The friend or the the Swedish Tennis Federation had dropped him. But yeah, the level of play. Even let's just back up a little bit. Uh, Gustavus Adolphus tell us that they're Division Two. I mean, Steve Wilkinson. He won a lot of national titles, correct? Division three. Yeah, he Division did. Three. Division three. Division three. Well, in a lot of ways, that's the true coaches because there's no no tennis scholarships. Yeah. I one time it was at Florida International a weekend tournament. I played a young guy from Gustavus Adolphus. This is when I was a full-fledged tennis bomb living in a van. Down by the river. Down by the river. So I played this young guy, and you know, I don't know if he was in the top six where he was, but he was part of the, the team. So I win the match. He goes and runs a marathon. It was Miami Marathon. So we had an 8 a.m. match. He, he, he's, I remember going, okay, well, I'm going to go try to run this marathon. It starts at 10 a.m. or 10.30, whatever. So he runs the marathon. He comes back. Talk about hardy people from Minnesota. He comes back, and then I have to play him a doubles match. He runs a marathon in between. But um, <laughs> that's not happening these days. With um, <laughs> yeah, was Steve Wilkinson. Uh, but he was a Zen master. He was really into the mental game too, wasn't he? Going way back. Uh, very, very much. Yeah, he was. He was. Um, yeah, you know, very educated. That's, that's, that's um, a great story that he, where he helped you out. Um, with, uh, I remember, so we, with Tyler Junior College, they had 12 courts. And at one point they had no lights. In the 10, the ten year that I was there, or my tenure, which was 10 years, 81, 91. Um, I remember, you know, I would see you at, because the upper four courts, the parking light, the light from the parking lot, was enough for somebody to just hit serves and serves only. And you were up there all the time hitting serves almost in the dark. Tossing way behind <laughs> your head or were you, were you working on that toss to the right then? 
that by then <laughs> I learned my, I'd gone through my injury. So, yeah. I mean, you know, it, so my coaches there was Fred Niffen and Robert Cox. Robert okay, went so, on to. Yeah, that's right. If you, if you said Fred Niffen and Robert Cox, I, I would have guessed the year because, uh, yeah, Robert came in. I was there with three coaches and John Peterson was the third one. I was just there for one year with John Peterson. But and ahead, I, know, I, I know, I know John Peterson really well because when I lived in San Antonio before I, I went to TJC, he he was a super cool guy, and he'd invite me over to Churchill High School and for practices. And then and I talked to John, amazing coach, and I even talked talked to Dash Connell, who still coaches there. But one of the things I think it might be interesting for some of the junior players to hear is that, um, you know. Steve, we've, we we talk a lot about you know players making commitments and, and learning to become more disciplined and all this. And I think a big challenge for a lot of kids as they enter college age is um, the social aspect. You know, I mean, not everybody. I mean, some some kids are really focused and they're they're very controlled in their lives, and some kind of get off to college and get a little crazy. You know, and and <laughs> that's what's what started to happen to me with you know the, the partying and stuff. And when I got to TJC. Um, you know, my, my roommate, Sam Olson, had just returned up from a, um, an LDS mission, and, and he was my roommate, you know, and I was like, man, you know, and I started asking him some questions, because I was really interested in that, in the spiritual side of my life, because I felt like I didn't really have a, a grounding at that point, and so that was a big part of what changed me, I think, as a tennis player, though, because, um, I mean, there was a transformation that took place. I did a lot of soul searching. I was trying to find out who I was and, and, uh, the spiritual part of me was really at the top. Of, it was a top priority for me. And especially because I knew I was having a tough time with all the partying. I was like, man, I can't, this is not good. You know, I've got to change this cause I'm, I'm an athlete. This is ridiculous, you know? Yeah. And, and, um, so I, I mean, that was a huge thing. And, and, um, I, I made this big change in my life and, uh, with, with, you know, Sam was a, a great example for me. And, and, um, and when I did that, that was right at the end of my first year there. Um, and I joined the LDS church and I, you know, I, I stopped all the partying and I was, you know, it was, it was like my, everything got into focus and we went to the nationals that year. And I'll never forget that because we went there, we had, you know, we had a bunch of foreign guys. There was like, I think there was one or two Americans on the team. There's two of us. And it was a you know they do a week long tournament you you know you play everybody plays in their flights and we were probably halfway through the week and we were in I don't, I don't know we were not doing well I mean maybe eighth place or ninth place I don't know something like that and our coach I think he was very frustrated with kind of how we were performing and it was a tough uh, it was a tough week and he ended up going back to get his camp, summer camps ready um, we were just down there together and we all met in the hotel room and we talked about how we were going to support each other and. You know, for the remaining matches, we probably had like 10 matches left. We were like, okay, this is what we're going to do. And I still remember that sitting in that hotel room talking about it. Mm. And we went to every, we supported each other at every match. We won every single match. It came, and that was the coolest memory of my probably my career. Mm. Scott Marshall was a great guy from Australia. I came down to his match. His dad, Arthur Marshall, was a, ran a, a big academy over in Perth, Australia. But... Um, small world, you know, but the, uh, my daughter lived over there and had lunch with Scott a couple of years ago. And, uh, That's cool. But, you know, we won it. Anyway, what ended up happening is we tied for first place. I mean, and that was, that was a miracle, I mean, really. And, and I remember on the, on the, the long van ride home from Florida <laughs> to Texas, I, I remember thinking, Man, I just took part in a miracle. I mean, that was amazing. <laughs> you know, like how in the world did that happen? It was really an incredible event in my life and in our team. And um, and then the following year, right, let me let, let me Cox, let, let, let me interrupt you, Robert Cox. Let me just interrupt with uh, one story yeah. leads to another story. But Scott Marshall, going back, he looks just like the hockey player Brett Hall, and. He certainly understood low to high, follow through, low to high, swallow through. <laughs> those Aussies doing those 12 ounce curls. So his father came to visit. So I must have been 30 years old. So I'm training tennis teachers and it was a tennis boom. Eventually we had over a hundred students there. And I, I remember Scott was big buddies with uh, Jim Rogers who from, was from Winnipeg. 
um, who came down. But anyway, Arthur Marshall said, let me ask you a question. And, you know, the Aussie way, he was being really friendly, but he was testing me and he said, where do you put the basket? He just, this was his question. Where do you put the basket when someone's serving? And I said, well, if it's a group lesson, you put the basket behind the players. And then you have to keep saying, toss it front, toss it front, toss it front. Mm. But if it's a private lesson, someone's just serving by themselves, you always put the basket in front. Oh. Because the, the nature of the human, the human being, I always tell people when I was a kid, I was a remote control because there was no such thing as remote control. So I'm the youngest in the family. And if there's, you got to change from ABC to CBS because there's two football games. I've, I would just lay by the TV, yep, change the channel, change the channel. You were the shortcut. But, but anyway, with Arthur Marshall, um, I think I got a vote of confidence from him when I answered the question that way. Mm-hmm. But another thing with Tyler, nice. Texas, on the religious side, um, it, I mean, certainly people had to drive like 15 miles to Kilgore, Texas to buy beer because Tyler was a dry county. Right. And where I went to school uh, up north, when I was a hockey player, when the Boston Marathon was run Saturday in April, say April 19th or whatever, is in this poor town on Lake Ontario, the hockey team would try to have one beer at every bar. And they had, had it mapped out and you could have 26 beers. <laughs> and I remember I went to uh, meet with a hockey coach and the hockey players, I never saw the coach, I never saw the campus. And you know, a young 18 year ago, yeah, I love this place. But uh, but in Tyler, it was a dry county. Um, you know, you went to a restaurant, you had to pay a membership and then you could order a drink. Right. But actually when beer trucks came in to deliver beer to those restaurants, they had, uh, I'm not sure how you would say it, but you they, they say if it was a big Budweiser truck, they had flaps where you'd pull it down and you couldn't see the beer truck. And when they came and they delivered in Tyler, you didn't know Secrecy. it was, there it goes, there's a white truck. That's where the beer is. <laughs> but, uh, um, the, um, but anyway, you, I interrupted you. You were about to talk about when Robert Cox, so you had a different coach, uh, between your first year and second year. I mean, I have, I've had students that have, you know, go to college and they have you know four years of college tennis, they have four coaches. But go ahead. I'm yeah. sorry. I, I interrupted. I just thought I'd throw that in about uh, no, no. Arthur Marshall. Yeah, no. So, he, he, so um, Robert Cox coached me my second year there and, and really, you know, was ex- he was a new coach. He was excited. He, he was really hard. And, and we went to the Nationals again with him. And we, um, it, it was really close again, but we, we did win it. And I remember um, that was a great year for me because I was, I think I was the one who clinched it for our team at the very end. I won my flights and, you know, I played, you know, it was, it was just a great experience. And I think the thing that sticks out to me is how I changed my life though. You know, how I became, you know, we talk, we talk about, are you a one or a two? Are you all in? Or, mm. and I think the, these, these changes within myself that need, that I felt really strongly about needed to take place were a huge part of what helped me to gain a more, you know, I'll use the word again, a healthy balance in my life, you know, and, and, um, and I started to become much more committed to being, you know, to, um, being in control of my life, you know, and, and, um, and I, and it was difficult because some of my friends were like, Hey, aren't you going to come party with us? And there was, you know, we were buddies. I mean, you know, we <laughs> go out together and I, I, I had to stand my ground and say, no, I mean, I can still go with, you know, with you guys, but I'm not going to drink and things like that. And, yeah. And that, uh, that became very important to me, and it, and it became a really, I think, a big part of what kept me focused as an athlete um, and kept me on that straight and narrow, you know? And so I think that point is, um, it is a really important point for junior tennis players that want to go to college to know that there are those trappings for sure, that you have to make up your mind beforehand, okay, what kind of student athlete am I going to be and how am I going to temper myself when it comes to those situations you you know you have to have that decision made up beforehand because if you're wishy-washy at all you're (laughs) you know i ended up fall to the peer pressure i ended up spending 10 years connected to tyler junior college and then 15 years with hillsborough community college yeah a lot of people they turn their nose up at a junior college uh the quarterback of the green bay packers trivia question who's that right now uh rogers yeah rogers uh, what's his full name? 
football. Jim Green. Rogers, right? No, 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 not Jim Rogers. Quarterback the Green Bay Packers, isn't it? It's not Jim Rogers. Um, anyway, he I'm played junior. I think right he now. played. Yeah, Aaron. Too. It's Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers. Aaron, Aaron Rodgers. Rodgers. Jim. Yeah. Aaron. It's close enough. Actually, <laughs> really have to beat myself up here. Matt Clore's out of here the other day. We've got a young kid here. Parents are both intellectuals, and I. I, I this is uh, the good Lord getting back at me. So oh, yeah. I said, hey, Clore, check this out. And I <laughs> called the kid's name off and I said, fill in the blank with any word. <laughs> Seriously, this happened just like five days ago. I said, because, you know, Clore is a jock. So I said to this young kid, Green Bay, any word. And I'm telling everybody, everybody else be quiet. Everybody else be quiet. So Green Bay. And I said, now I'm going to give you one hint. Green Bay and football. Any word. Kid didn't know. Kid didn't know. Green Bay. Yeah, actually, Matt was out here today, and we have this rebound net. And I said, all right. And we had, you know, 12 uh, respectable players. So there's like eight of them because four of them are studying. So Matt's hitting in. And I said, all right, Claire, check this out. And I just, he's catching it. Like you're turning like you're a shortstop and throwing the ball into the rebound net. And it's amazing how tennis players – you know, you get players where they have a palm down service motion, but when they throw, they it's like they're throwing the shot put. Um, yeah. But you know, one thing from a recruiting standpoint, I think that you know, parents listening is you would. And it would so you're talking about playing at Tyler Junior College. At one time, Fred Niffen was waving the American flag, and he had all Americans. But then he, you know, he, to be competitive, it, it almost t- turned the other way. I know I coached that team on an interim basis where. Um, so we had between two teams in the lineup, we had one American, Scott Stewart. But from a recruiting standpoint, um, two different times I held the team on an interim basis. One time the whole semester, um, but it, they had five players from Brazil in the lineup. So even now with the internet is typically what will happen is say you got a really good coach or excuse me, a, a Really good player from um, Sweden. Coach calls him at the office. He says, "You have any friends?" Yeah, yeah. But they all they they also want to make sure that the friend plays better than them. So <laughs> the kid from Sweden is playing three. One time in Minnesota they had six Swedes. One time at Auburn they had six South Africans. So it's it, you know it's you would think it's very sophisticated, but um, you know there's lots of players that you know be from one country. Or, okay, I'll, they definitely have a French connection. Well, they do, but it's just that they had one really good French player and brought another good French player, and it just works out that way. You got that a lot, right, Joey? Hey, do you got any friends in Minnesota? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. And, and did you spend any time at John Newcomb's, I mean, in San Antonio or Big Farley I worked Park? at John Newcomb's. I worked at, T-Bar, I worked at T-Bar M and John Newcomb's in the summers. I would... And I'd save up money and then go play tournaments. Um, T Bar M in Dallas, in fact, or was that where? Uh, no, at that time, no, it was at New Braunfels. Okay, New Braunfels, yeah, there's two. Yeah, was, I remember about that back then. Yeah. In fact, when I my first year there, at the end of the summer, me and some of my teammates, um, like Scott Marshall and Andrew Love, and these guys that we were all teammates, we went and played all the Texas Men's Open tournaments. And I remember at the end of that first year, I got ranked like 45th in the Men's Open, and I set a goal the next year to be top five in the men's open. That was a big goal. And I wrote it down. I had my list of all the things I was going to get better at and do. And I worked so hard that year. And, and um, that was, you know, I talk a lot about goal setting in my training and, you know, and believing, you know, being able to organize goals, be inspired, you know, have an inspiring goal, but also um, have a really solid plan to work on your skills. And um, I wanted to be top five and I, and I, at the end of the next summer, they, the, the sectional tournament was at the end of the summer. And, and I, I remember I did, I probably visualized that tournament for nine months and I, I got in, I got to the finals. I ended up playing a, a guy who had been like 80 in the world, who was Robert Trogolo, I think was yeah. his name. Um, and um, I lost to him in the finals, but I mean, I, you know, visualization kind of, you know, preparing for, a breakthrough, something that's really meaningful, you know, and, and that's Billy Chadwick who, who recruited me from Ole Miss said, that's the thing that got my attention. You went 45 to five in one year. That was pretty, that was interesting, you know, and, and he, um, 
keep me up and uh, I'll be for grateful for Billy and you know the two years at Ole Miss where I went next and played in the SEC and that was a big time thing for me um, you know it was a great place I loved Ole Miss loved the people loved the coach um, it was you know it was a great way to finish off my college tennis back in the day with uh, you know, playing Texas Open tournaments I remember Billy Freer from South Africa who's been the executive tennis director for Club Corp, based out of the flagship in Dallas, Brookhaven. Um, I remember him being ranked number one, and he was at Lakeway in Austin, and you know, in the Texas te- newspapers and the Texas, you know, tennis newspapers, the Texas magazines, he advertises at number one. Tennis, I think, really needs to go back to that because that could be the silver lining of the pandemic. Is that tennis? Um, people just played locally and you know, everybody played mm-hmm. men, men's opens. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember, um, you know, it was a, kind of a feather in my cap. It's kind of funny. You say, well, it was top 20, it was 19 in the men's open in Florida. And, but with that, um, you know, even the 25, sometimes the, the matches in the 25s with these teaching pros, everybody was playing mm-hmm. and that's not the case so much anymore. Um, you, you know, you used to have to, qualified to be in a national age group tournament and they yeah. had national 25s which they dropped but now if you want to play say national 35s 45s you just sign up it's open if you if you want to just it's an open draw yeah. because so few people are playing um with uh do you remember that name billy freer was he's he's older than you would he have been playing during those that those times i don't i don't remember that name yeah with uh did you play um after uh, old Miss, did you try to play some pro tennis? So when I was um, when I was just finishing up my junior year at Old Miss, I made the decision that I was going to go serve a mission after college, and um, I really wanted to go play. I wanted to go like over to Europe, you know, and do do kind of those money tournaments, those club tournaments they did, and and but I I had this. Um, opportunity before me to go serve an LDS mission. And I thought about that for a good eight months or nine months. And I made that decision. So no, I didn't. I, I finished up. I went back to San, uh, San Antonio. I worked for a year, saved up money. And then I went to South Africa for two years. Um, and, uh, you know, I had a great experience over there. Then, you know, that was amazing. I was there when they released Nelson Mandela and all that change happened. And it was really interesting, you know, amazing experience for me. Loved the people, loved the experience and came back. And then I moved to Southern California um, at the very club that my brother Jimmy runs the Advantage Tennis Academy in Newport Beach. It's probably, I mean, it's they, it, it's an amazing club. They're right now with COVID, they've done a really good job being able to keep tournaments going and things. And, and um, so this is where we're based, and this is where uh, my son Spencer trains. And um, yeah, so full circle. I taught there mm-hmm. about twenty five years ago. So you taught for <laughs> you taught for Sam Olson, is that right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. For, for our Sam, listeners, Sam uh, like so many of our students, uh, he started in tennis, and now he's very successful in real estate. Actually, Scott Schultz recently um, retired from the USTA. But I met with Scott. He invited me up to Lake Nod to want to talk to me. And I was in a meeting with Scott and a representative mm-hmm. of the Discovery Channel. And Scott was in charge of the USTAU, United States Tennis Association University Program. And the goal was to try to have 20 curriculums for tennis teachers across the land mm-hmm. and across the U.S. And I was asked how, how many of my students got into the tennis teaching business and then they got out and they were asking from a recruiting standpoint, because actually if people want to get into business, actually becoming a tennis teacher initially, if you went through one of these professional tennis management programs, it, you know, you have to wear so many hats. You have to be a greeter. You have to be, it's almost like a, you know, mini entrepreneur where you're, mm-hmm. you got your own pro shop, you're running camps. And, um, but um, no, that's, that's an interesting point. With, uh, you know, this, Is that, go ahead. Oh, go. I was going to say, in fact, with Jimmy, you know, with Jimmy and I coached there together with Sam and 
I think it's interesting to, to know that Jimmy went to Tyler, to, to Tyler and trained with you. I, I, I basically, I think I recommended it to him. And then he came and worked in your, and spent some time with you in your program. Yeah. Went to school there for some yeah, time. Yeah. And then yeah, uh, Sam had, he must've had a dozen students uh, out in Southern Cal at one time. With, um, yeah, no, he, and he, I mean, so we, Jimmy and I then, then came up, Jimmy had served a mission in Sacramento. We both came home at the exact same time and we went and coached with Sam and Sam had some great players that came out of that program, you know, uh, Kevin Kim, mm-hmm. Malin too, Eric Lynn. I mean, there, there was a Jeff Abrams. There's a lot of good players. So it was, and this is where we're at now. So it's been really kind of a cool thing to come back to, but, um, spend some time with Jimmy and get to watch him and what he does with players. He's been doing it for many, many years and has had a great, uh, training program there for a long time and um yes yeah, it's, it's fun it's been a lot of fun we're glad to be here um yeah it's we a wanted to give spencer go ahead we wanted to give spencer an, an opportunity to see here to, to, to get in a really good tennis environment and get away from the high altitude you know which is a little tricky and, and be in a, in a really good tennis spot no we have a network right now we have a student of yours and a student of jimmy's out here I uh, love the title of your book, Worthy to Win. I mean, just great title. Uh, tell us about Worthy to Win. Tell us about you know, the program. So Worthy to Win is, you know, at, at the, I guess at the core, I mean, it's a story. It's a story of my life, you know, that I, um, I was a kid who, you know, use sports as a vehicle to try to find this feeling of worth within myself. And, and sometimes that's, you know, it's not a bad thing. It, it, you know, like I said, like I was explaining earlier, you know, when you're going through hard times in life, there's certain things that keep people going, you know, wh- whatever it is. And tennis was like that for me. And I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be the kid holding the trophy up, you know, <laughs> I was one of those kids. Like I'd go to the tournament and have the trophies up on the, de- they used to put them on the, like the desk where the, you know, behind the, the, this to check in. And I'd sit there and just stare at those trophies and be like, man, I can just visualize that on my room. That's going to be huge. You know, <laughs> and start thinking about, you know, being a champion, winning, you know, all those things, but worthy to win was, is really a story of my life and my, my relationship with my, my dad and my brothers. And, um, you know, and how sports was a big part of our, a cultural thing in our family, starting with my dad and then, and how we all wanted to be athletes. And, um, and, you know, I think every kid at some level, I mean, I mean, look, who they all want to, they want to hold the trophy up, right? They want a trophy. They want to, and they want to feel like they've done something great, you know? And, um, I know there's a lot of different ways to look at competition, but that's, that's how it started. And, the the problem though later is that if you if you if it's too outcome focused right it can become very pressurized and you you lose the meaning of getting better like we talked about earlier so it has it's kind of a double edged sword you know but one of the messages there's three things I I talk about when it comes to worthy to win so one is um, in order to be worthy you have to believe you're capable of getting the win every time you walk on the court you have to believe you have a, sh- a chance I don't care what the UTR or the level of the other players. Um, if you don't, if you don't feel like you have even a shot, you know, why, why play the match? Right. I mean, um, focus on playing your game though, but you got to go out there with that inner belief system that says I'm capable, you know, uh, you know, I'm worthy. I I've done a lot of training. I've done my work. I'm, I'm ready to go. So that's number one, teaching people that inner belief system, you know, that you are worthy. And when you're wor- when you feel worthy of something, what's interesting about worthiness and then I, there's no coincidence why I use that word is that you feel um, well, a lot, a lot of times I'll ask kids, what, what do you think that means? They'll, they'll say, I feel like I deserve something, not in an entitled way, but I've put in the work. Like mm. I want to, I'm, I'm going to go after that thing because I, I'm worthy of it. You know, it, it, I think it gives a deeper level of drive and commitment when someone really embraces that within themselves. And I've felt it in my own life and as a competitor. And number two, you have to do the work in order to be worthy. You know, and this is something you guys talk a lot about. You got to put in the reps. You got to, yeah. you got to have the swings. You got to, you, you, you can't just, you know, base it on a dream. I mean, you got to back it up with, with um, statistics and, and concrete tools and weapons in your game. And you have to, 
And I've tried to really instill that in, you know, you know, we, we talked about Spencer, you know, in, in his mindset that, you know, you have to have the tools, uh, but you got to have that inner belief that sometimes people don't even understand. It's like, you know, your dream and your passion and what you, you got to have both. And then lastly, I say that you have to understand that your worth as a person is not based on your wins and losses, on your ranking, your status, or what anybody else thinks of you. And yeah. if you if you fall into, and that's the problem with social media and all this stuff, kids are comparing themselves to each other, you know, and and uh, you know, and parents get caught up in it too, and it's it's very toxic, you know. It's like your worthiness. I mean, I, I say to kids sometimes, hey, if if you were all of a sudden the number one fifteen year old in the world next week, let's say it happened. You know, do you think you'd be a happier person? I li- I love to ask that question to them. I let them think about it. I'm like, and we kind of talk through. Would you feel more confident? For sure. I mean, oh yeah, you bet. I mean, that's uh, that's obvious. Would you feel fulfilled? Yep, I would. I'd feel like really fulfilled. Like this is amazing. Would you feel a sense of accomplishment? Yes. Would you feel happy? Well, there'd be some elation probably. That would it go away though? Would it? You know, would it go away? You know? Yeah. Huh? It may. It may and and we all come to the conclusion, yeah, probably long term it wouldn't necessarily make me a happier person, but you know, and, and it's interesting to have that discussion. You know, I would like to say, what happens to the guy who wins Wimbledon or the gal who wins Wimbledon for the first time? What are they doing a couple weeks later? Yeah, they're grinding somewhere. Yeah, out steady, the, yeah. they're, they're grinding, and and this time now they have a target on their back, right? Yeah. and everybody wants to beat them, and so it's. If they, if if we think that any accomplishment, award, status is going to bring us some sense of inner bliss or happiness that's long term, I, I I don't think that's the right way to look at it. Yeah, super One, important. I was just going to say these days. I mean, with tennis, you've got the the tennis social media is basically the UTR, and in America, the recruiting. You know, where you're one star, two star, three star, four star, five star, blue chip. Um, so they are constantly looking at those two parameters and it is just like social media with followers and then you know trying to keep up with the joneses if you can keep your worth with how you're preparing basically to win and, and building skill that's so important one of our longtime associates former student mark span started off as a tennis student tyler junior college tennis tech south african um, his mother uh just recently passed away and she she was a Wimbledon doubles champion. So Mark told me to start asking students this question. Andy's messing with my papers here. <laughs> we go through brain typing, the J's and the P's. So uh, Mark told me to ask this question. And actually, husband and wife, they, they start arguing. You want your child to be happy or successful. Yeah. There's a book, uh, Happy. The prof- I should be able to tell you the, the author's name. He, he, I'm sure he still is, but he's a professor at Harvard. In my take on it is you want to be happy or successful. If you're out there hitting tennis balls, you're already happy. Yeah. So you, you want to be successful because you're already happy. I mean, I take a group of kids to a coffee shop, a place like Panera, mm-hmm. and I grind them on, wait a minute, you know, the kid on the other side of the counter, that's the kid in the real world. You know, you're here with your mother <laughs> exactly. and father's little plastic money. Yeah. Um, like your son we talked about last week, buying the wrong type of bagel. <laughs> um, right. But, uh, <laughs> But no, it's interesting. But then success, uh, you know, I think people really in sports just study John Wooden. Success is that peace of mind just that you've done the best that you possibly can. Um, and, the, and that's where, you know, I think co- I think juniors will misinterpret. Um, we very seldom, you know, through John Wooden, for example, we, we very seldom talk about winning, but we do grind people on attitude and effort. Now, another thing, too, is that in the U.S., tennis is shrinking, letter, you know, it's less people are playing. It's much easier to be a higher ranked player in the U.S. now. And all you have to do is look at uh, college tennis. And there's many factors to that. It's not just that the college players, uh, the foreign players are better. The foreign players just say yes to the first opportunity. And the coach, the, co- the college coaches don't want to really play the waiting game. And they say, okay, and the expression they use is, okay, we're going to get this horse in the corral. We're taking this kid. Where the American kid, he wants to go to UNC Chapel Hill and he's going to turn his nose up at UNC Charlotte or UNC <laughs> Wilmington, something like that. But with, um, yeah. So when it comes down to, um, you know, right away, kids start to think they're a, 
they're a big fish, but we have to let them know they're in a small pond. Um, you know, I think that's where tennis could become global. The USDR has a great slogan, local to global. I think that's missed where it's all about the number yeah. instead of you got to play, you got to, it's not your UTR number. It's how many matches you're playing and then how many matches you're playing for what your parents have to pay for those number of matches. You know, Wayne Bryan's always saying that if you can get on your bike and ride around the neighborhood, is there anybody who you can play? And then you get in the car and you drive around a couple, a couple blocks or where the area you live in. That'd so be nice. more matches. I was just going to say, it'd be nice if we get some numbers on strokes, you know, where do you have 450 degrees of rotation on your serve? How many RPMs of top spin do you have on your forehand, your backhand? Or I need to follow up on a comment I was sent. I was, I made, I made some notes or a post that, you know, in the NCAs, uh, someone like your son, it's not true with the pandemic right now because there's so many UTRs as a result of COVID. But someone like your son becomes a really good junior, 17 years old. He's signed a letter to go to UCLA, letter of intent. And if it was a normal school year, he's not playing with college players and can't train with college players it's against the rules. And then college players are limited how many matches they play, how many hours they can practice per week. It's not, then it's how many weeks per school year. And then in the summer, they're on their own. They can only play so many matches per season, per year. Um, but then the, the pro level player, it's just almost impossible for, I mean, you just think it's a financial nightmare to play pro tennis. Um, but anyway, that, that comes down to, uh, I guess another subject is how to have people play more matches, but your work is to have them have the best mindset for playing matches. Um, let me just, uh, go over two things here. Then you talk more about worthy to win is, uh, Jim Lair, who's probably the best known mental toughness coach. I spent a lot of time with Jim. He used to come out to Tyler, Texas, and I had a lot to do with Dennis Vandermeer, uh, back in the day, and and so did Jim. Reiner Martins, you know, Jim referred to Reiner as a, one of his teachers. The definition of mental toughness, eliminate the external stimuli and focus on the task at hand. The task at hand is hitting the ball. Yeah. And I'll say a few more things about Jim, but turn it back over to you, is that uh, you're one of the only mental toughness coaches I know who deals with <laughs> hitting the ball. Yeah, I mean, strokes. You know, Jim Lair used to say, if for two things to be mentally tough, you have to have strokes that hold up under pressure, and then you have to be super fit. You know, we have a large library, and we have a lot of film with Jim Lair. I mean, you know, we have his books and audio tapes and such, but when somebody comes in and they run a 10, 15-hour seminar, you film it. Um, but tell us a little bit more about your, your day-to-day with Worthy to Win. Well, um, one, one of the things that I, I just wanted to mention, because when you asked me about the message of Worthy to Win, was that um, I, I always tell players that, you know, at the, at the end of it, you know, your, your worthiness is not dependent on, you have your, your worth, period, you know, and that your, um, your worthiness as a person is not attached to any performance event or outcome in your life. Um, but the... My, my, all my kids, my, my oldest son's Ethan, my daughter, Lauren, Ani, Etienne, and Spencer, you know, I've, it's been a cultural thing. And my wife, Wendy, we we talk a lot about, you know, the principle of worthiness in our lives as we all pursue different things, you know. Some are doing, you know, amazing stuff in school and beyond and in work and businesses. My wife is a nonprofit that she's worked very hard to, to get a great message out, a healing message. And so the, but again, you know, it's, we're not doing this to prove ourselves. You know, we're doing this because it's, it's a passion and it's something we want to pursue. So I like to infiltrate that message and t- with every player I work with, you know, the day to day. In fact, my son, Ethan works with me a lot with Worthy to Win over the years. He's done a lot. I mean, and a lot of my family members have my, my daughter, Lauren has helped a lot of graphics and things. And, and Wendy's always there kind of being my mental coach in many ways and pushing me forward. But, um, when I, as I work with players, um, I have a training program. There's a book I wrote called Worthy to Win. 
it's on Amazon and I've got a rewrite that's about to come out and his version and um, there's a workbook and then there's a um, there's a online course that we're doing a lot of zoom trainings right now with with groups you know, like a team training um, so we're this is something new that's for the last year and a half and it's been exciting you know, with COVID it's been great because we can get you know groups of I've got you know training clubs academies you know teams doing this where we can um, they can go through the course get snippets every day you know it's like 15 minutes of training time online and at the end of the week we do a zoom training as a group and we basically facilitate what they learned and that's been working amazing I mean I've got you know, some academies on board with that, um, and training, training groups around the country. I'm really excited about that, you know, because I really believe that just mental skills in general has to be in the day to day, you know, it, it's in the preparation, it's the way they're thinking and things, you know, Steve, you talked about with, um, preparing them for match play, you know, um, so they got to have the mindset beforehand. Though it's, it's not just what happens during matches, right? So when I talk to players, I'll say there's three areas that we're going to work on. One is the inner game, which to me is thoughts, feelings, emotions, expectations, and pressures. Everything that's going on inside of you, you have to know how to handle those. You have to have the skills. And there's there's a cognitive, you know, uh, training, um, and then there's emotional intelligence, you know, and. Uh, you know, all the understanding how you, well, I call it understanding your mental personality. Um, the second part I call the outer game, which is body language, reactions, pacing, um, mm-hmm. routines and rituals, all you know, preparation, all the things that go that we see either before or during the match or after. Um, and the last part, for lack of a better term, I call it grit and resilience training, which is character, work ethic. Um, Could you repeat that? The last one? Yeah, what do you call it? Um, um, grit, grit and resilience training, resilience. you know, which is like character development, you know, um, self-honesty, um, self-reflection, you know, like, you know, a reflection after matches and being honest with oneself, which you know, overcoming avoidance, it, it deals with um, grit and really helping players to just compete no matter what the score. They, they get so attached to the score. I know I did at times, you know, and we're playing the score versus playing the match, but, you know, trying to figure out how to, how we're winning points and, and looking at this thing in a completely different way. And that's why I call it mindset development. Um, because your mindset, it, you know, like the, the word focus to me is more of like an immediate thing. It's I'm focusing on this thing. Mindset is everything that's going on behind the scenes. It's the way you see the whole thing. So I, just, I, so, just, I, um, want, to, I want to let Andy know that I just wrote down uh, that I got to start being honest with players. <laughs> just have to start being honest. <laughs> no, I, I think you've got that players. one. Down. I think you've got that one down, yeah. Steve. With, I think uh, you've got I, that one down. We got that one from cradle to grave, minute by minute. But you know, the one thing is, you know, Andy is a Braid Knight. You know, spent so much time with Vic Braid, and you know, when Vic passed away, it was it was six years ago in October. Yeah, two thousand. So many nice people. Vic was great. And people were so happy to have met Vic and. You know, people would say say a few things to me, or Andy, same. Is that you could tell in a minute they they really were not a Braden Knight. In other words, they mm-hmm. to to really know what what he contributed to tennis to the nth degree from a technical standpoint. You know, he accumulated or he built up so much more information than than the norm, and mm-hmm. um, just misinterpreted because his presentation was so strong. Yeah presentation was so strong. Uh, you know, one thing you mentioned when you got to do the work. You talk about being honest is that I've worked with so many of your players. You brought so many people to work with us. And the first question I asked them is you're working with Joey. Have you, have, go ahead. Have you read the book? Is that what you're going to say? Yeah. Have you read the book? And I, um, at one point we were only up to two people who had read the book and, um, <laughs> with, um, I read your book. Um, when it comes down to, is not a matter of just working hard. It's working smart. Um, a very right. smart man in tennis who's on the other side with, you know, I say um, ball hopper pros and briefcase pros. Doug Cash is, you know, known throughout the industry being a very bright mind for tennis, but more on the business side. And, you know, he recommends uh, at one point it was 55 hours a week, pro works, 
he takes a day and a half off, but then, you know, what do they produce? And are they just at the club, just hanging around? You know, what do they actually produce? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but so I think, you know, are you putting in time? Are you putting in effort? But no, I would consider you to be a great relationship coach. And I think teachings, information transfer, um, coaching is a human relationship with, um, teaching. I know you as a player, uh, again, I was not in the situation to say, uh, Joey, okay, let, let's film you and let's show you how, you know, we had just, I just said a few things in passing to the team players, but you know, what happened in that community, Tyler, Texas, you know, we were like second class citizens because the team was the biggest deal in town, the, the tennis team, they were winning national championships. And, you know, but by the time I left, you know, we had girls that were in high school that were beating girls on the team. We, we didn't have junior boys that were better than the, because they were boys, you know, they were like, you know, 17 years old when they start to get, just be a senior in high school. But yeah, I think work hard, work smart. Um, you know, I, I mentioned, uh, Austin Krychek, uh, when we touched base, um, cause his dad was on yeah. uh, one of our podcasts. And I think if people start to listen to our podcasts, you know, we're, we don't think that we're going to be a magazine where we just interview people randomly and there's no connection, but, uh, d- tell us a story about Austin that you told us. That would be great for the listeners. Well, Austin, um, was in, you introduced me to Austin, right? You know, you you called me up, and he was about two seventy five in the world in singles, and he really wanted to. I mean, Austin had obviously skills in doubles; had won an NCAA doubles championship, and but he uh, he. I think the opening story you told me was he's the nicest guy. Like he 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 lost a match; he threw a banana peel down on the ground, and then. He took it up and put it in the trash. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's a good um, way to sum up, Krychek. Yeah. So and that's, um, a, that's a compliment, I started working really. With, mm. but, yeah, yeah, and I started working with Austin on on mental skills training and um, taking him through the Worthy Win training program, and he was one of the most dedicated um, pros that I had worked with. I mean, like I, he just did everything I said, like, I, okay, do this and this, and this, and I follow up with him next time we talked. And he, he almost always did it. I mean, that's nice. Um, well, I was down at Saddlebrook once I had done training with a lot of their players and, and Renee, uh, who coached Isner came to me and said, this guy's a worker, man. He did. And I go, he does everything you ask him to. He's <laughs> like, mm-hmm. we're talking about him and, so Steve, you had done some work with him as a kid, and then later, that's when I met him, and you had done some, some uh, videoing with him, I think, right? And that's when you brought me in. And but he, he just, you know, he just was very into it. He just wanted to get better. He, he had, he said, I, I don't think the same way in singles as I do in doubles. I mean, I, I look at, you know, when I lose, it's way more personal, and it's, and that happens to a lot of people, you know. They, but Austin was very focused. He had. He had a drive, and I worked with him. I worked with, you know, um, I talked with you a lot about him. I worked with Stephen Armitage, who coached him at one point, and and you know, I'll tell you, I mean, he got he broke the top hundred in the world. I mean, and was really had made a lot of progress and um, some pretty cool stories with him. And just you know, I was there when he won his first challenger, working with him. And, you know, I remember one time he was playing the BNC uh, Indian Wells and. He was in the qualities and he was in the last round of qualities and he was down like one five, I think in the third and against a good player. And he came back and won that match. He told me, he goes, I haven't done that since I was like 14 years old. <laughs> and, um, so, but he really applied the principles and, you know, learned. I asked him once a couple of years after I worked with him, uh, after I started working with him and I said, what, what are the key things that stand out in your mind? We were just talking one day and he said, well, I see losing so differently as a singles player. He goes, I, it's, it's completely different from the way it used to be, the way it affects me. And that's the thing about the worthiness message. You know, if your worth isn't based on wins and losses, you can tolerate losses a lot more. And you can also tolerate taking chances and developing your game. You know, the reason why a lot of the kids don't want to change a stroke when they, they, they've been told a thousand times, man, that forehand needs work or whatever is because all they're thinking about is the next tournament coming yeah, around exactly. the corner, you know, they don't want to lose and lose. But if their worth isn't so connected to that, 
it opens up the floodgates of opportunity for them to go, yeah, I'm going to go for that. Why not? And I think that's what happened with Austin. He, he started to realize, you know, that, you know, but this, this isn't a reflection on me at all. I just got to keep doing the right things and going for it. And he did, he did very well. And he was, you know, it was always fun talking to him. That's great. Like, I lived in Tampa for 15 years and spent a lot of time at Saddlebrook. Um, John Nisner, um, you mentioned Renee. Renee went to Auburn, but he actually played at Tyler Junior College like yourself. And, yeah, he did. Um, I can't think of Renee's last name right now. Senior moment. Muller. Uh, I think Muller. Yeah. I think he's still at Saddlebrook, but um, with, uh, yeah, again, so many things. That I just think of junior college tennis and the SEC. I mean, they, they were both very, very competitive. Um, but you got to be competitive when it comes down to, okay, my coach has written a book. I've got to, I've got to read his book. I've yeah. got to be competitive. Um, I always tell kids, you know, when you use toothpaste in the morning, it's not just a white tube, a blue tube, a toothpaste. There's a name on it, you know, Crest versus Colgate. Mm-hmm. Same thing with a bar of soap. And um, yeah, you got to, I think it's so healthy to just try to learn how to compete. Um, I think that parents need to, talk more about their backgrounds and not the financial pressure, how expensive tennis is, but when it comes down to, you got to do your job. I mean, if you don't do your job, yeah. you know, you're promoted, you're demoted, you're terminated. Um, and it's a pretty heavy to say, well, okay, tennis is a job. I, I don't like the word job. I think project, you know, you're actually trying to build something and it's not really a matter of building wins. It's, it's, it's a matter of building character. And, you know, the kids we work with are superstars compared to the, the ones that hang out at the, the most popular sport in America, going to the mall. <laughs> what, and Joey, when you're working with academies and, you know, a lot of these junior players, what are some of the things that you see in common with the kids as far as areas of, you know, that need to be worked on or problems? Is there anything that stands out that's across the board? Problems, uh, yeah. Well, I think that um, right now, with with social media being such a big thing in the world, mm-hmm. that you know, kids obviously are so conscientious of their their image, you know. And so, I, I, I talk a lot about your ego. You know, what is your ego? Your ego is your self image, how you see yourself, and mm-hmm. it could become so so d- challenging and d- addicting, almost. You know, they're they're so concerned about looking at how other people view them, you know, whether it's their peers, their coaches, their um, parents, you know, themselves. I mean, I think that's a huge challenge. And again, that's why player development gets left in the dust a lot of times because they're just so worried about how this is going to look if I were to lose to this person. Oh my gosh, that would be the end of the world, you know? And, um, and I think that's a universal challenge right now. You know, um, UTR, I mean, I, I love UTR. I mean, I, I think, I mean, they do a great job, you know, with the algorithm and all that and how they, I mean, UTR has been fantastic during COVID. I mean, they've, they've sponsored a lot of events and tried to do it in a safe way and, you know, all that. Um, and it, I think it has its place and it's a great tool. But when these kids become, they're like checking it daily, you know, I'm like, that's a problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Parents are talking about it too constantly. I'll, I'll say to kids a lot of times, who'd you play? I played an 11.6. No. Who did you play? You know, yeah. do you know this opponent? That's that's how they're referring to kids now. Yeah. You know, no, the and, UTR is great. I wish that in this country the UCA just totally embraced it. I, I understand the ITF has a number mm-hmm. and the world pin number, and you know they say they need to do that because they want to make sure they can regulate gambling, uh, so no matches are thrown. But you know, parents and players, coaches, uh, here's an exercise is have a group of kids sit around during a water break and say, okay, let's come up with the other numbers. There's the UTR, but, and you can have a very long list. Mm-hmm. Um, if, it's a, if it's a rain delay, mm-hmm. you know, what's your pulse rate at rest? What's, mm-hmm. your, re, what's your recovery area? Yeah. You know, when it comes down to, um, you know, a little bit more difficult to really do true body composition, but you can get one of those body fat scales when it comes down to what's your mile time, what's your 400 time. And, you know, how many times can you, uh, you know, hit a serve, middle of the box, bounces three feet up the fence. You know, you serve 10 of those to those, 10 of the ad. Um, 
So I guess anything that can be measured, but I think people just think of the the outcome, not only the win, but the outcome is the UTR. Yeah. You know, in the UTR, there's some negative. It's not perfect. Um, we had a pool of uh, coaches and players, unfortunately, that, you know, we had a little bet going that a player wouldn't finish a tournament. And I didn't realize they, they didn't finish the tournament. Um, they thought, well, there's so much pressure, I can't lose at this level. The match is tight. They fake injury. But the kids are faking injury now at six all, or six games. You can't yeah. help me out with that. Six yeah. games, right? If so their UTR doesn't get affected. And, um, but anyway, if say, for example, you're playing a match um, and you know you can win the match, but you're going to experiment a little bit in that first set. Even Chris Everett asked Djokovic one time, mm -hmm. why don't you come in? Yeah, you're you're know, winning 6-1, six, 6-1. One, six, one. Why don't yeah. you come in a little bit? Um, Djokovic said when he held up the trophy, Mr. Laver, the Australian Open, I know I need to go to the net more. I'm working on it. Yeah. But mm -hmm. when it comes down to, um, it's not like you're tanking the first set, but you're coming in more. He said, well, I know I can beat this guy by just staying back. But I've been told, work on my game, work on my game, go forward. Um, but now kids are pressured just they don't want to lose games. Mm. You know, we always tell people you lose the first set, you're down one eleven, a game played to two. You play the first set to figure out how to play the second and the third. Yeah. But, you know, here's uh, here's something you can talk about. I know um, players that are out in uh, Southern Cal working with you. I'll just use the first name, Zach, TJ, and Alex. And with Zach, it's like, how's his forehand going? Or with TJ, how's his serve? With Alex who overall, very good ball striker. You know, how's the bending and jumping? And, you know, that's like, you know, when it comes down to um, whatever it is, you know, like I grew up in ice hockey, is can you skate? Mm. And if you can't skate, you got to learn how to skate. And um, I think that's amazing in tennis, so because the scary thing is you're being compared to the person on the other side of the net. And... Um, you know, we had, uh, one of our students who's, a, he's a volunteer coach at, uh, University of Georgia. He's here just to pop in, say hello, uh, Raleigh Grossbaum and, um, yeah, just answered a few questions and the kids were just shocked that the players at the University of Georgia are, mm -hmm. they're 14s mm -hmm. on the UTR and the, the, kid, the kids just started looking at each other because they're just stuck on trying to beat someone who's an 11. You know, they've been a 10 a long time. Yeah. But, you know, those, th those three players, um, you know, when it comes down to if one's hitting, one's hitting a better forehand, that's going to have the UTR go up. If the one's hitting a better serve, you know, if one can you know, really get up and not be lobbed so easily, that's, it's, that's what's going to help the UTR. Got to get skills. But, yeah. um with the problem with the social media, just going back to that quickly, what kind of advice do you give? Because it's obviously a double-edged sword. You, you've got to keep up with the te technology and it can be a real blessing with all the different things that are available now with technology and video so readily available on phones. But what's the advice you give as far as screen time or managing that whole social media thing? You know, just, just, Along the subject, so Steve, you had wrote, you put something in one of your posts about Spencer being being a becoming a blue chip, and that was that's how we both found out. <laughs> we're we're we're, we're um, meaning, you know, I'm really trying to encourage these guys to um, just lose themselves in in the day to day of training, you know, and. You know, you, you guys were grilling Spencer on, you know, how much screen time do you have? And, you know, you're cutting it down. And what are you doing as far as routines, rituals? You know, do you, do you chart yourself? Do you watch video of yourself? And, you know, and he, and he does a lot of that stuff. He could do it more for sure. And that's where I come in. You know, I'm like, honest guy, you know, like, come on, come on. We got to watch that. Yeah. We got to go over the stats on that match. We got to, you know, you could do a much better job with your, you know, your physical preparation, your mental preparation. I mean, just, it's just constant, you know, uh, I'm a, I'm a pretty one track mind kind of person, you know, 
if someone says, hey, I want you to hit 300 serves a day, I mean, I, that was kind of how I was. I'd be like, okay, yeah. I'm doing it. Okay. Yeah. Here it is. I'm going to do it. <laughs> you know, this day, they're so distracted. Your minds are going a thousand miles an hour, you know, in so many directions. So that's where, I mean, you know, so what do I say to parents? I say, get them really structured. You know, I talk to a lot to kids about time management and mm. the value of using their time. And we all could do better. I know I could, yeah. but you know, having a schedule, having priorities, going over what you accomplished. My son, Ethan, he's, he's in sales. He's an amazing salesman. And he, he's a master at that, you know, like getting people to set goals and then look at what they really did or didn't do, mm. you know? And, um, and, and, you know, reflective thinking, you know, right, Steve, I mean, you talk about that all the time, reflective yeah. thinking and getting, getting them into the day to day, you know, the, the 10 minutes, 10 months, 10 years thing. That's what it's all about, right? It's the being, being in the moment, you know? And, and, um, so, you know, with UTR, I'll say, don't look at the, you know, I would, I do, I do not recommend you studying the UTR and player record of everybody you play. Yeah. It'd be great to get a scouting. It'd be great to get a scouting report if you could. That'd be great, but let's not. You know, because you know they may start looking at this. You know, I'm I, I'm an eleven and I'm playing a yeah. an eleven nine. Oh, you know, it's yeah, like exactly. man, and and the the wheels start spinning. It just all this interference. You know, external yep. stimuli. Right. That's what you just talked about. <laughs> yeah. And it's and it, you know they they got one foot in the grave before they walk on the court. You know, yeah. and so. Uh, I, um, I, I really talk to people about that and, and recommend, uh, no, let's, let's get into the prep. Let's get into the mental prep, the physical prep, Is your game plan clear, you know, your tactical game is solid. You know, I, I like what Steve just said, you know, are you ready to, and are you open enough in your mind to experiment in that first set to see what they, what, what they do or don't like yeah. a lot of kids, they go in and they're so forced in the way they're thinking about playing. It's just, it's rigid, you know? And so there's all different levels of mental training and mindset Joey, you know you want them to go in yeah go ahead sorry no i was just gonna ask you to let our our listeners know if they want to learn more about what you do and and worthy to win is it worthy to win.com yes worthy to win.com okay perfect yeah so one thing with yep, uh, and my book my book's on amazon, amazon. worthy to win uh yeah we tell people for warm-ups Get up in the morning before you leave the house. You do something, yoga, stretching, shadow swinging. Yeah. And then you try to hit 30 minutes. Hopefully it's on a court, but if not a backboard, a parking lot with, with a partner. The third warm-up is the traditional warm-up. And the fourth warm-up is the first four games where you just have to make discoveries. You know, just break sweat, get the butterflies out. Yeah. Hit the ball high and see if they take it out of the air. Well, one story with uh, Blue Chip. Um tennisrecruiting.net, Arush Ganji, who your son has done so many things with. Now, you're, you're, Arush is the same age as your son, but he took the gap year. And that's one of the reasons that he was bumped up to a, a blue chip. The gap year for us now is the eighth grade. And for our listeners who don't know, the, the NCAA rules, they vary from one sport to the next. So it used to be that you know, foreign players would come over. They could be 20, 21 years old. And um, I think it's always been great to have better competition. So there's been an upside. Maybe that has to change with the pandemic and saving programs, but it's always been an upside to have all these foreign players come over because, again, competition is better. I think we, as coaches in America, it's like, okay, we need to produce better players. But the 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 field wasn't level. So it was 18 year old American kids competing against say a 20 year old, 21 year old yeah. foreign kid. Yeah. So now if you want to find 365 more days, um, I talked to a parent just today that their son is uh, accepted into Ivy league school. He's deferred. He's taking a year. He's going to come down and train with us over the winter. I can't play tournaments because we have a six month grace period. Once you graduate from high school, uh, if, you, if you do play tournaments, then you lose eligibility. But Andres Barbosa has helped us out so much with helping players with housing in Miami. He he told me that Rush Ganji was a was a blue chip. I didn't know he was blue chip. And you know, I think of players. Well, here's a guy who's not going to the net, or here's a guy who's got to improve his mm, backhand right. ground stroke. But your son and Rush were playing ITA tournaments this summer. Uh, Intercollegiate Tennis Association they do a great job providing tournaments. So they they weren't doing what they were told, and 
Bruce's father called me up. And a lot of times, you know, parents will only be mad for, you know, 24 hours. A coach is mad forever. You know, it's like, <laughs> okay, I will forget that, but I won't totally forget that. I guess you could forgive and not forget. So, um, so, and yeah, I have a very good relationship with Bruce's dad. So after 24 hours, he's, you know, he just called up and said, hey, the guys are goofing around. And you know they're not charting each other's matches, watching each other's matches. They're not stretching. They're just not doing what they're told. And but it's at, it was at a tournament, so I was at uh, NC State. So Dave Secker called him up. I called up another person who was there get the, get the report. But that's one thing with um, you know where confidence in the, the work ethic. You know, okay. You know you're practicing. You know you're playing a, a match. We have the cameras. You know, put the you know, go put the camera up. You know how to chart a match. We say, okay, we take care of your academics. That's number one. But just chart twenty points. And then what would I think where some of our players lose confidence? They don't have the work ethic. They don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, those type of experiences. I mean, this is my sixth decade of coaching that those things didn't exist. You know, like, okay, put a camera up on the fence, film yeah, the mats. Right. And, you know, you've been taught to chart five different ways. And um, so I think in that way, sometimes it's like, well, okay, there's, we're asking too much. Um, but at the end of the day, they should take their notes to their journal and, you know, they're going to get out what they put in. Exactly. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, the journaling, the, the you know, reflective thinking, um, so huge. You know, it's it's the details, within the details, and and I love the thing about the four warm ups. I think that's that's awesome. That's a great way to help them to understand how important that is. Kids when they play an eight a.m. are just you know they're lucky to do one warm up. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, you yeah, know. you know we we call it suitcase tennis. All you got to do is look at a draw sheet. And the scores read like this, 7-5, 6-1, 7-6, 6-0. <laughs> yeah. Competitive in the first set, people lose the first set, and then they check out. They're there physically, but mentally, emotionally, they don't compete. Um, you know, experts, uh, obviously, I could, we consider you an expert. Anybody who's been around the game as long as you have, seven out of ten matches are predetermined. I remember my son Connor was in Sweden. You know, he was... Uh, you know, I think, you know, obviously brought up differently in tennis in the sense that wasn't really concerned about the USTA rankings in the 12s, 14s, 16s. He spent a lot of time working with Dave Anderson out in Texas. So it was the same message, different messenger. I mean, he wasn't going to tell him, you know, to hit the ball differently. Mm -hmm. And because he was um, a Florida resident and at that time in Texas, he's calling me up and He's at a major zone, but he's got to play in the B draw. And he's been practicing with a guy who won the A draw. He goes, I haven't lost a set to that guy. I said, Connor, it's 14 and unders. No one can play at a really, really high level. It's 14 and unders. With uh, Jose Garris, great line about 12-year-olds, someone has to win. So there's way too much emphasis put on winning. You know, For us, the 12-year-old who's a better player is the one who hits the most overheads. Winning's not confusing. It's totally confusing. Skill development. Um, but no, it's been a lot of fun to, to work with you, actually. Um, you know, you certainly learn more. I know your, your brother went through the tennis tech program, but um, you, you, he, he was with us, and then you went on to the SEC. Um, but really through your son, um, you, you really spent a lot of time becoming a student, what we've been a student of, which is, these different tennis coaches, a system of systems. Um, yeah, no, it's been great. Joey, I really appreciate all the time and well, all the insights. And if you want to, no, know, thank you. Any, anything you wanted to leave our listeners with any last thoughts? Yeah, I, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, one is, you know, it's been such a great experience for me, you know, getting exposed to great base tennis and, um, and, and really understanding, I mean, there's, there's, a, you know, there's intelligence that comes from so many different directions in life. And, you know, my, my goal always with, with my kids is, you know, is to try to help them become the people they can become, you know, and, and reach, you know, their full potential as a person. And, 
And I know that um, in my time being with you, Steve, and and down watching what you do and going on, you know, some, uh, you know, that European trip and whatnot, you know, I've always feel I feel I've learned a ton, and, and it's been um, very insightful to me as a mental coach, you know. And and I do coach on the court too. Obviously, I've worked with Spencer a lot. You know, I've been his primary coach the whole time, but he's had exposure to other other concepts, other people like yourselves and. Um, and um and even my brother jimmy down here at times you know and it's been it's, it's a it's a, it's a group effort you know but it's it's been a privilege and i've really enjoyed learning i still you know if i'm not learning then i feel like i'm i'm not moving forward as a coach mm. um so i appreciate all that you are doing for, for tennis players and for coaches both of you and your team down there um well thanks i'll, I, I, I'll say this go ahead no, go ahead, Steve. Well, I was just going to say, you know, it's it's fun to go back. And, you know, I mean, I started that program in 1981. And I had already, as I mentioned, worked for Vandermeer, Van Horn, and Braden. We weren't calling what I was doing at that time the Great Base. I mean, certainly there's so many other tennis teachers that have influenced what we do. But that was really a lab that um, uh, what, what we did at Tennis Tech and uh, but the, in, in the final analysis, we say say it probably in every podcast. The umpire is going to say, "Ready, play," mm-hmm. and the proof's in the pudding. Mm-hmm. You know, can you hit it? Yeah, and you got to have a serve, forehand, backhand. There's no getting around that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, go ahead, tie it up for us. So, uh, you know, we talked about advice for parents. You know, one thing I always tell parents that I work with is, I, I say I made every mistake in the book as a parent, and I'll freely admit that um, <laughs> it's been. You know, we're all learning together, and it's um, it's a learning experience. You know, and, and when we make mistakes, we have to learn from them too, and and forgive ourselves, and and know how to improve. You know, all of us. Um, I think that's important. Another thought that I have is that Wimbledon, and I, I like to share this with players because we talked about some of the problems with outcome based thinking. You know, on center court, as you walk into the doorway of center court. It has a, a line from R- Rudyard Kipling's poem, If, and it says, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, you know, and the way I interpret that is if you can meet with, you know, losing and winning and in a sense, find a neutrality in your mind and just go compete and just compete, you know, you're, you're going to have your best result. That's, that's the person who's going to play their very best on that day. And, um, and, and, in play inspired tennis. Last thing I'd say for, for the players is, you know, be an example, you know, like inspire other people by the person you are and the way you play. You know, I love the concept of becoming an all court tennis player. I mean, which, you know, which, which you get, which you guys teach. I, I believe in that. And I told Spencer, I said, you're going to be a tall lefty. You're going to be six, four, you know, lefty. Well, if you don't have a really good serve by the time you're 17, 18, I said, then we've really screwed up, you know, and, and, and coming forward and learning how to force, you know, and we have that discussion like every single day, we got to come in more. You got to, you got to, you got to find the way to come in, you know, and Mm -hmm. pressure people. Um, But the, you know, but be an inspiration through your example. One of my, I'm a big sports movie guy. I love Chariots of Fire. I love the Eric Little story, you know, and how, he had this principle that he felt very deeply about and he said he didn't want to compete on Sunday and he took a different event and he won the gold at it. I mean, I love that story. You know, um, he believed in something, be an example, you know, mm-hmm. um, it's not, you know, it, it's, it's not just about us, right. It's about, it's the whole interaction with other people and our, our opponents and how we handle it. And we, you know, we can all do better. And, and so I think that's really key. And that worthiness part of it, if, if you if you really know where your worth comes from, then you don't you don't have to prove anything to anybody. You can. There's enough success for everyone. Every every player out there. No, it's you don't so have to well be played. jealous of kids. You don't. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's you know there's room at the top. Um, well, with, with my age, uh, I just sometimes ask kids, "Have you been 66? Have you been 65? Have you been 64?" I tell you. Uh, you mentioned Chariots of Fire. I love sports movies. So my son, Michael, he goes to a Jesuit school and he's a senior and there's a father son retreat and there's 30 fathers and we're staying at 
Catholic Church has a place where we could stay. Um, so, so there's you, you share a room with your son, and and so we were just there for uh, lunch, dinner, breakfast, lunch. A priest runs the workshop, and um, he's in his seventies. So we go in, and the very first thing we do, they say we're going to watch a movie. And they play Chariots of Fire. <laughs> and my son, just, I just look at my son and go, this will be interesting. Because, I mean, I just love playing movies like that. But here's the kicker. And I, that's where I you know, come across, well, that's a dark cloud. But this is where we are in the U.S. And um, this one to happen when you, were, was in, you and Andy were a kid. Uh, I was a kid. And I, I have kid radar. So I just hear the kids chirping. And they don't want to stay for lunch. And, okay, it wasn't like going to wherever they wanted to go. Bennigan's TGIF. I just heard TGIF Fridays. <laughs> can we go here? Can we go there? And so my son asked me the same question. You know, and I, you know, gave him that look like that might have been the <laughs> dumbest question yeah. you ever asked. You ask so here's the kicker. So there's 30 students, 30 dads. There's 60 people. Only six of us went to lunch priest. And there's certainly a few people assisting the priest, tuna fish sandwiches, chips, nothing fancy. And the, the lunch was already made. And, um, for 60 only, people, for 60 people. Yeah. And there was only six of them. And the, and the, and I think also too, is that, you know, I mean, what could they do? I mean, I, I really think that it should have been the, the priest sitting us all down and say, Hey, you guys all got to come back next weekend. You know, nobody understood the messages. <laughs> nobody understood the messages. And, that, you know, and I think that's where, um, I think if people are politically correct, I mean, they're a politician. I mean, when it comes down to it, that's just wrong. And, um, you know, I do appreciate what you do from a mental toughness standpoint, because you will tell a kid, you know, that forehand, that backhand is not going to help you out in the end. Um, yeah. And that, you know, that you, when you read, uh, you know, the, the two minute waiting room at Wimbledon. Uh, that's like Jimmy Connors. The greatest thing in life is to play tennis and win. The second greatest thing in life is to play tennis and lose. I mean, that's something I, I repeat weekly. Yeah. But you know, to, yeah. to, to win, you know, you get you know, it comes down to confidence comes from winning. Winning comes from skill. Skills come from practice and know how. And we've done a a lot of work on both. You know, the practice is the application, but the know how is the information. But it's it's been uh, fun to be part of the journey. It's a, it's a long a, a long road, and uh, your son Spencer and the, all the other players you work with. Uh, time to go forward, and more to come. Yeah, it's great. Thanks, Joey. No, Joey. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks. A lot of great messages, and I'm sure our listeners got a lot out of it. Uh, again, worthy to win. Thank you so much. Yeah, Johnson Part One, Johnson Part Two, <laughs> and tell Jimmy we're gonna give, <laughs> tell Jimmy we're going to give him a call. <laughs> I'll let him know. I'll warn him. All right. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank All right, you so yeah, much. Joey, thank it. you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 All right. A lot of good stuff. Yeah. Great conversation. Yeah. I hope our listeners, I mean, these podcasts are not short, but they just, you know, put the headset on, go for a 10 minute walk and <laughs> just find 10 minutes because there's, uh, there are not coming from us, but from Joey Johnson's nuggets for the tennis treasure chest. Yeah, no, it was great. A lot of good advice is in there. Well, yeah, you can uh, check his information out again, worthytowin.com. Check out his book on Amazon. And then check out our website as well, greatbasetennis.com. Free courses. We're on social media. So balance your time. But at Great Base Tennis, you can find us on social media. YouTube, we're going to be doing a lot more. And if you're connected, to come. sorry to interrupt. If you're connected with a junior tennis player, could be any tennis player, tomorrow ask them. It's a great question. Are you worthy to win? Yeah. From Joey Johnson, I, you know, some kids are wearing new shoes, and I just ask him now. Yeah. Are you worthy of those new <laughs> shoes? That's great. So, try that. Thanks a lot for listening. All right, everybody. We'll see you next week, where we're going to talk about brain typing. Brain typing. Brain typing. Put our brains to brain typing. <laughs> All right, everybody. Adios. Good night. <laughs>